Good evening and welcome. As soon as I get down here, I can't see that anybody's still here, but I think you're still here, right? Uh, thanks for coming out tonight on what turned out to be another glorious day in Southern Nevada. I'm Bill Brown with Brookings Mountain West. On behalf of my colleagues, we're thrilled to have our colleague Ted Picone out from Brookings to speak tonight on Cuba, a very timely lecture given the change in U.S. policy. I don't know if it's changed in the last hour or not, but <laughs> we'll find out. Uh, uh, we are, are proud to put on this lecture series with our colleagues here in Greenspun College, uh, including the staff who are helping us by recording the event tonight. Uh, I will just give you a little background on Ted. He's a senior fellow at Brookings and involved in the project on international order and strategy and the Latin American Initiative in Foreign Policy. His research focuses on global democracy and human rights policy. He's also the author of this book, Five Rising Democracies and the Fate of International Liberal Order. You cannot have my copy, but uh, for those of us in the university community, it's available through the university library, but I encourage you at no urging from the author to get on Amazon and grab your own copy. <laughs> uh, Ted received his law degree from Columbia University and his undergraduate degree from the University of Pennsylvania. And he, as I mentioned from his background, has researched, studied, traveled, and can give us a unique perspective on this important foreign policy topic. Ted, the stage is yours. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, Bill, for that introduction. And I also want to thank Caitlin Saladino from the Brookings Mountain West team that have really made me feel very much at home here in Las Vegas. I'm a newcomer. It's my first time here. And I'm discovering that we in Washington aren't the only ones living in a bubble. Um, I'm also learning how to properly say Nevada, Nevada. No, I still don't get it right. Um, so I have to work on that. So uh, the title for tonight's lecture is Cuba and the United States as engaging our adversaries work. Let me ask, first of all, has anyone here been to Cuba? Two hands, wow, three, four, okay. Uh, does anyone here want to go to Cuba? <laughs> all right, that's a good, that's a good response. Um, well, you know, um, as American citizens, there are restrictions on your ability to travel to Cuba. You may not go as tourists to Cuba, it's against US law. But I will get into some of that um, situation. It's the only country in the world that we treat like that. And uh, it's quite unique. Um, so I'm going to get into some of these issues. But particularly, I want to get into how we got to that position. Like, why do we have this very restrictive, punitive embargo on this small island off of our coast? Um, and what effect this new process of normalization uh, may have on not only on the United States, but on the current and future uh, of Cuba. Let me also say that, as you know from uh, the experience, I'm sure, with Brookings Mountain West, that you know, Brookings is an independent institution. Uh, we're nonpartisan, and we don't take institutional positions on anything. So it's really up to the individual scholars to do their research and, and speak uh, not on behalf of the institution, but from our, our platform. And so um, I should say, full disclosure, that I'm not a neutral observer on how this policy has changed. Um, although for most of my career working on Latin America, both in and outside of government, I really avoided working on Cuba. Uh, I really saw it as a dead end street very political, poisonous really for many people who've worked on it. But after I got to Brookings and there was already a Cuba project underway and the folks running it were recruited to go into government, they asked me to take it over. And uh, I decided, well, maybe it was time for me to learn a little bit more about, about Cuba. And so I began studying it and visiting the country and talking to people in Cuba and around Washington and around the country. And after really thinking hard about it, I, I did come to the conclusion about four years ago that President Obama should make a big bet on opening relations with Cuba. And I, I wrote quite a bit about that. And to my 
surprise, that's exactly what President Obama did on December 17th, 2014. And I, I was lucky to be in Havana uh, on that day and witness firsthand the, the excitement and the relief uh, upon hearing that announcement and a sense from Cubans that you talk to across the entire spectrum that um, the, they could see light at the end of the tunnel, that there was a really more hopeful future. And I've been back to Cuba since then to try to evaluate what changes on the island occurred since then, uh, those already underway by the Castro regime and those that had something to do with the US policy. And also to assess the long road that still has to travel for normalization to occur. I mean, this has been five decades of hostilities and antagonism. It takes a while to unwind that. Now, as I talk through this, I will do my best to present a contrary view, um, because with any bet, there's no guarantee that the new policy, which we call constructive engagement, will lead to the outcome which we all would like to see. Uh, that outcome would be a secure, stable, prosperous, and free Cuba anchored in our increasingly democratic hemisphere. So let's begin with the state of U.S. policy toward Cuba before December 17th, when this big announcement was made. And that will also, I think, help illuminate the arguments for and against maintaining uh, the old policy of hostility toward the island. Um, there's so much packed into U.S.-Cuba history, it's impossible to get through it all. I'm just going to mention a very few uh, highlights for those of you who may not know uh, all the history. Remember in 1959, uh, actually it was in January 1959, Fidel Castro and his band of revolutionaries overthrew the Batista regime, which the United States was very closely allied with and had supported for, for decades. Um, and that began a process of uh, increasing uh, central government control over all aspects of Cuban life. Uh, economy, society, family, politics, etc. cetera. Um, there was a whole process of expropriations of property, private property, including many properties uh, owned by American citizens and companies. Um, there was an exodus, of course, of many Cubans to the United States. Some of you may have heard the Peter Pan uh, exodus where children um, were sent, uh, left their families behind and came and settled here. And they came to Florida and New Jersey and Nevada and elsewhere. You also watched Fidel, who despite his initial promises, uh, pretty quickly aligned himself with uh, the Soviet Union. And this, of course, in the midst of uh, the Cold War, uh, created a tremendous amount of pressure on the Kennedy administration at the time, first Eisenhower, then Kennedy, uh, to do something about it. And so, for example, you had the failed Bay of Pigs invasion in April of 1961, where a group of Cuban exiles were uh, trained and, and sent to Cuba and a complete failure. Um, in 1962, you had the missile crisis, uh, where after very uh, intense negotiations, uh, those missiles were uh, removed from Cuba, um, but nonetheless, it really locked in uh, a sense of an emergency that uh, President Kennedy used to impose a fairly comprehensive embargo pursuant to his uh, powers granted by Congress. So you have, in just a short period of time, within two or three years, a uh, Cold War confrontation that Fidel Castro used to uh, pull in the Soviets as his patron uh, for the island and set up the United States as the evil Goliath to uh, Cuba's David. And uh, through a combination of repression, also tangible improvements in the economic and social uh, life for Cubans, for most Cubans, and then periodic out-migrations of any opponents within the country, uh, the Castro regime over these many years have really, has really succeeded in beating the odds, uh, consolidating power, and punching way above its weight on the global stage. It's one of the reasons it has captured so much uh, attention uh, around the world for pulling off that, that feat. 
and our, the United States, repeated failed efforts to bring down this regime, including attempts to assassinate Castro and then counterattacks by Cuba, whether here or in other countries, for example, in Africa and their support for armed insurgencies in Central America, this only further fueled the hostilities between our two countries. So that, that kind of sets the scene. Now, I'm going to jump forward to 1989 and you have the collapse of the Soviet Union. So their patron disappears and Cuba enters its so-called special period when the economy cratered by over 30%. Uh, blackouts and rations were common. Uh, bicycles replaced cars on the streets as the way to get around. And for, for many anti-Castro opponents in Miami and Washington, they really saw this as the moment to tighten the screws and force the regime's collapse, force a hard collapse. President Clinton, uh, and I was working at the National Security Council at the time, preferred a, a less confrontational approach. But it all came to a head in 1996 when uh, Cuban planes from the Air Force shot down two uh, civilian aircrafts that were um, piloted by Cuban exiles from Miami uh, who were dropping leaflets around the island. And this, as you can imagine, resulted in an uproar in Congress. And Clinton felt he had no choice but to sign into law the Helms-Burton Act. Uh, which codified the existing comprehensive embargo uh, against Cuba. Uh, so instead of it just being a matter of executive authority, it became a matter of, of law uh, written by Congress. And this law conditioned its lifting on several things. The establishment of a democratic government, free and fair elections, full respect for human rights, departure of the Castros, return of all the properties that were expropriated or some kind of resolution of those claims. And it narrowed the president's authority to take action to relax it in the future. So now moving ahead to the President George W. Bush, um, another effort was made to try to force the regime's collapse. And a whole commission was set up to draw up plans to be able to kind of rush in advisors and money and technical assistance from the United States once the Cuban people rose up against the Castros. Congress to kind of try to seed that uh, appropriated new money for what are called democracy assistance programs, which now to this day, every year, it's now up about $20 million. So that accumulates over a period of time. It's frankly, you talk to uh, folks in the US government, they're like, we don't know how to spend all this money. Uh, and it hasn't really had much of an impact, as you can see. We also spend more money on programs called radio and TV Marti, which broadcasts uh, news on the island, which is otherwise a very censored uh, media environment, although I'll say more about some of the changes. Now, in, in 2001, given the, um, the, the, the complaints about the humanitarian harm associated with the embargo, some changes were made uh, for agriculture and medicine in particular, some telecommunications equipment as well. So this was a provision that Congress passed to allow at least some uh, goods to be exported uh, to Cuba. Now, some, and one other really important thing happened during this uh, period, which was the election of Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. And the Bolivarian revolutionary government in Venezuela uh, gave Cuba a critical lifeline in terms of oil and gas subsidies, uh, partly in exchange for medical and educational and security services from Cuba. This has become the number one uh, source of foreign revenue for the Cuban regime is the export of services, not just to Venezuela, all over the world, in Brazil, in the Middle East, and in Africa. Um, so that turned out to be a nice deal for uh, the Cuban government. And throughout the 2000s, particularly when oil prices were so high, it allowed them not only to receive this cheap oil, but excess supplies that they could then turn around and re-export onto the global market. So they had a source of, of um, hard capital. So here we are, say, in around 2006, and it's clear that all of the efforts of our government and others who opposed the Cuba system 
uh, had made to try to force the collapse of the Castro regime had failed. And now, around that same time, Fidel Castro's health started to decline. Um, so in 2008, you saw the uh, formal transition from Fidel to his younger brother, Raul, who's now 85, um, in, and that formally occurred in, in 2008. So a smooth, kind of uncontested uh, transition uh, from one Castro to the other. So the Castro family is still in power. You have one party, the Communist Party, in control of the economy. And the US is completely isolated internationally uh, with its punitive embargo. Uh, now, let's talk a bit about Raul Castro. Raul Castro is not Fidel Castro. He's more of an institutional builder. He comes from the armed forces where he was Minister of Defense for many years and more pragmatic. And he began a series of reforms, what they called updating the socialist model, um, which had certain features. One was to gradually reduce the size of the state in the economy, encourage private sector, small enterprises and cooperatives, allow Cubans to buy and sell property, uh, to own cell phones, um, and since 2013, allow Cubans to travel more freely off the island and then return, which used to be very restricted. Um, so these were all important steps in gradually granting Cuban people more independence from, from the state. So these trends are beginning to take hold. Around this time, a little known senator from Illinois goes to Miami and says, if I'm elected president, I will try a different approach towards Cuba. I will try to directly engage with our adversary um, while also supporting the Cuban people and uh, the, this kind of beginning of a rapprochement between the diaspora communities in the United States and Cubans on the island. So as soon as Obama got elected, uh, with, by the way, winning Florida, um, he adopted some measures that he could take under his authority uh, to facilitate travel, trade, and people-to-people -people exchanges, mostly for Cuban Americans. I mean, the initial set of um, of these uh, measures were designed to stimulate more exchange between Cubans on and off the island. Um, but the, 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 the Raul Castro government was somewhat suspicious about all this. And in 2010, they arrested a USAID contractor who was on the island using this democracy assistance money I, I mentioned to help hook up satellite telecommunications uh, equipment particularly for the Jewish community uh, on the island. The Cubans arrested him, said this is a violation of our, of our law, and threw him into jail for five years. Um, and this was a real chilling effect on any promise that Obama had made to try to find some way of engaging with Cuba. It really stopped the whole process in its tracks. Obama gets reelected in 2012, and there's another effort to try to break the logjam and negotiate some kind of deal. And so a series of secret meetings were held and really cleared the deck of the most controversial cases. You had an exchange of American and Cuban spies. Um, and, and yet we were all really taken by surprise by the, the drama of what happened on December 17th. In, in Cuba, the joke went something like this. In the old days when Fidel and Che Guevara were sitting around smoking cigars, Fidel remarked that it would take an Argentine pope and a black president in the White House to get the job done. <laughs> sure enough, the time came. The Vatican did play a role in helping to negotiate this, uh, this deal. So the big bet was made, and President Obama said we're going to um, uh, have diplomatic relations with, with Cuba. And so I want to quickly review what the key elements were of that. Um, and of course, I also want to reflect the Cuban point of view because they've got a lot more at stake in this relationship. I mean, for them, it's an existential uh, question. For us, it's one country among many. It doesn't have, it's not as, as our own military officials have told Congress, Cuba does not pose a national security threat to the United States, or no longer does. 
Um, so let's keep in mind that the Castro government in negotiating with the United States is not a defeated regime. You know, they're still in power and they're prepared to defend their revolution uh, while, yes, also updating it to ensure continuity. But uh, they, they, are, they haven't given up on, on the project. It's also worth noting that within Cuba, people from different walks of life and different political views, there's a lot of consensus that they do want to protect the economic and social gains of the revolution. Uh, and that's an important feature of the Cuban system. But there's also a lot of frustration and anger and impatience about the pace of change. And you see that, of course, reflected in the very high migration numbers, people leaving the island. Um, the, the island is also vulnerable to uh, the unreliability and now significant decline of, of support from Venezuela. So oil prices are way down, the Venezuelan economy is tanking, and they have cut their oil subsidize, uh, subsidies about in half. And just to mention a few other challenges, where are they going to get their oil and gas from? They tried to do a lot of off-sea drilling, drilling offshore, and that has come up empty. Uh, they don't have the ability to re-export the oil at high prices. They have a significant brain drain, uh, both on and off the island. So, you know, Cuba is quite proud of the fact that it has developed a professional uh, medical and education sector, uh, including in the pharmaceutical sector. Um, but a lot of those folks get paid at wages that, you know, you just cannot live on. Uh, if you think the average worker who works for the state in Cuba, which is the majority of Cubans, get paid on average about $30 a month. Now, there are rations that they receive in terms of food. There's free education, free health care, et cetera. Transportation is relatively cheap, although it's getting more expensive. Food is getting more expensive. So uh, a lot of the professionals are leaving their jobs as engineers and technicians and et cetera, and going to work in the service in the tourism industry, where they can make <coughs> 5, 10, 30 times more money. And there's a reason for that. There's a dual currency in Cuba where if you're working in the tourist economy and you're getting tips or you're working as a taxi driver, you get paid in a different currency. And that currency is worth 25 times more than what everyone else gets paid. So, it, I mean, if you were a rational economic actor, you would leave your job as a doctor and become a taxi driver. And thousands of them are doing that. They're also opening uh, restaurants and B&Bs. They have a room in their house that they can rent out to visitors. And this is really an uh, important part of, of the economy. There's also an important uh, development demographically. The, the trends are really running against the country. Uh, you have very low fertility rates. You have an aging population that uh, there's a bulge right now that will be retiring mostly in about 10 to 15 years. So it's going to look a lot more like Japan or other countries in a similar situation, but without the resources to support all these uh, retirees. They've tried very hard to attract new foreign investment, and they've changed their laws. Uh, they've developed a new uh, special development zone outside Havana, uh, and they're pulling in, they're trying to pull in new companies to help with everything from renewable energy, light industry, pharmaceuticals, but it's, it's working very slowly, way behind expectations. And that's because there's some fundamental structural problems with the Cuban economy. As I mentioned, you have this dual currency, which re really distorts any pricing, your ability to understand what a good, uh, the value of a good actually is, and if a state-owned enterprise is profitable or not. And it kind of hides the winners and losers in the economy. You have a, a stifling bureaucracy and very uh, heavy red tape. You have aging infrastructure uh, that's literally falling down before your eyes, uh, as those who have been there can, can see. Their agricultural productivity is very low. Uh, they import 70% of their food in a, in a country that's full of fertile land. Uh, there's no fiscal transparency. You look at their budget, they don't share that information. They're not a member of the World Bank. They're not a member of the International Monetary Fund. So they're not complying with any of the rules that almost every other country in the world follows about 
opening up their books. We don't know what the budget actually looks like. Um, so they have some very limited options uh, when, you, when you look at all of this. And, and they, know, they, they know what the problems are, and they know they need to diversify their economy and not become so dependent on one or two patrons. Um, they know they need to retain their young people if they're going to succeed, um, but they, they aren't ready to kind of concede to the, the great evil empire to the north uh, that they need this kind of, of help. You know, for all of these years, if you know a little bit about Cuban history, going back over 100 years to their fight for independence in 1898, they don't have full independence. They've always been under some kind of uh, restriction in terms of property. You know, we control Guantanamo Bay, naval base, for example, under a lease that uh, will continue until we decide to cancel it. So that's, they don't have full control of their territory. They don't have economic sovereignty because of the embargo that we impose on them and their reliance on other countries. Um, so there's still, like the dream of independence has not been fully achieved. And, and they know they need the US, but at least to remove the sting of the embargo, but they're not ready to embrace us by any means. They want to keep us at, at arm's length. There's a real uh, lack of uh, any serious trust. So if you think about that scenario I've just laid out, you would say, well, then the United States has some real leverage. You know, we should be able to, to do something here to influence it, maybe not as much as we think we do. And the problem is that our, our very heavy-handed approach over the years has not only failed to dislodge the Castro's, it has actually backfired. Um, I mean, you can't, first of all, you can't have an effective sanctions regime with a coalition of one. We are completely isolated at the UN, for example. Every year there's a vote condemning the embargo. And we usually get Micronesia or Palau to join us. Um, and it's also really hamstrung our own ability to help the Cuban people with uh, their own aspirations. You know, many of them do want freedom, but they're not prepared to uh, take up arms to dislodge the government. And of course, any time they do, the government is right on top of them to prevent it. And the government is able to say, well, you all who oppose us, you're mercenaries of the United States. You're on the payroll of Washington. And that's just unacceptable. And this continues to be a running theme uh, of what happens in Cuba. So even when you try to bring in international actors, uh, we had an incident recently where the, uh, a leading uh, human rights uh, activist who had been killed in a car accident under suspicious circumstances some years ago, his family wanted to give him a human rights award in his honor. And they invited the Secretary General of the Organization of American States, which is a diplomatic body in Washington, and a former president of Chile to give this award to. And the government of Cuba refused to let them into the country uh, and said this was just a plot by the United States to uh, force the regime to, to fall. So even just giving out a human rights award has you know, become something <laughs> nefarious. Um, now, you also should, I mentioned how a coalition of one, you know, in terms of how the Obama White House was seeing its policy toward Latin America in general, it really came to the conclusion that the Cuba problem was interfering with their ability to have a normal relationship with the region. And the region was quite good in organizing uh, with Cuba to say, we're not going to come to your summit of the Americas in Panama unless Cuba is invited, which, which they did finally uh, break that knot because of the December announcement. All right, so let me switch now to consider some of the changes underway as a result of the new policy of normalization. And I would say the verdict is still out. It's still early days after you know, five decades of isolation. But let's, uh, you can point to a few, a few things. One is immediately you had the release of 53 political prisoners uh, and of, as I mentioned, the, the exchange of um, captives. Um, after years of virtually no engagement or cooperation, we now have several bilateral cooperation agreements our dialogues underway, including on difficult issues like human rights and property claims. 
We have law enforcement cooperation, uh, cooperation on agriculture, maritime security, aviation security. We have regularly scheduled commercial flights. Um, we have uh, agreements on protecting uh, the waters if there's an oil spill, and on and on. Um, Migration. We, now that is one area we've always had a set of talks, but it's been very controversial because under U.S. law, any Cuban who makes it to the United States is automatically declared to be a political asylee and gets fast-tracked into the line for a green card and then eventually citizenship. They also get additional privileges in terms of welfare benefits. No other nationality is treated this way under U.S. law. Um, so that now has been changed uh, as a result of the dialogue that's underway. It was one of the last things Obama did when he left office. And they put an end to what's called as the wet foot, dry foot policy, where, any, as I said, anyone who steps foot is declared uh, an asylee. But if they're caught on water, they're returned back to Cuba. Now, um, they're not even allowed, you can't, they can't just walk in illegally. They need to go back home and get a visa. And that's a big change for, uh, for Cuba policy. And, you know, so far we haven't heard any complaints from the Trump administration on this point of the policy. I think it fits with his vision of, of border security. Uh, and it's also pretty well received in Miami because over time, uh, a number of the Cubans coming to the United States were really not political asylees. They were economic migrants. And they were getting their green card and immediately going back to Cuba. Um, so if you're a political dissident and going back to Cuba, it's kind of hard to show that you meet that test. And so there's a big loophole that was being exploited. You've also seen, of course, uh, more direct contact between Americans and Cubans. Uh, across many, many different fields of professional activity. Um, civil society groups on the island have become more active and they're given more space to, to criticize the government, to propose new ideas. Um, but I have to say, in this area, they operate in a gray zone. And so um, they kind of test the boundaries and then they get pushed back. And it's not really clear how much influence that they have. Um, for, for artists, for religious groups, uh, there's a lot more uh, freedom and they are kind of taking advantage of this new space for, for dialogue that the U.S. policy is, is supporting. I think the most important factor is the emerging private sector because all these Americans who are now coming to see the island for the first time are spending a lot of their money at these private B&Bs and restaurants and on taxi drivers. And this is really um, giving families uh, new sources of capital, either to reinvest in their own businesses or to just even get by uh, in, from a day-to-day -day basis. So we, you know, that to me would be one of the most tangible benefits of the policy so far. You also, now that Cuba's open to foreign investment, they're hearing from all these foreign investors for the first time, not just Americans. Yeah, we're happy to do business here, but you need to change your rules. I mean, you need to get with the 21st century. You need to be more transparent. You need to show us how you're going to comply with the rule of law. Are there fair arbitration systems, et cetera? So they're kind of hearing that, not just from the Americans, but from many others on what they need to do at home. You should also keep in mind that the, the popular support, both in Cuba and in the United States for this policy is very high in the 60s and 70 percent range. And not only for normalization, but it's very high for lifting the embargo as well. And this support includes uh, high majorities in Florida, uh, among Hispanics, and even within the Cuban American community. Uh, in my view, if you look at what happened in November, uh, there's a myth circulating that Trump won Florida because at the last minute he went to Miami and he met with the Bay of Pigs veterans and said, I will reverse Obama's policy and we will bring down the Castros. And uh, to great applause, but in fact, if you look at the way he won Florida, it was because of an overvote of rural and exurban residents of North and Central Florida, which came out in big new numbers, for, for Trump. And Trump actually did no better than Romney uh, among Cuban Americans. And Hillary Clinton won Miami-Dade County, where most Cuban Americans live. 
So, but nonetheless, uh, there's a sense I've heard from uh, those in the White House who think Trump owes the hardliners for their coming out to vote for him. And he's already put a lot of their people in different positions, at least on the transition teams. We haven't yet seen if they'll get uh, further in line. Another development is that there's this bipartisan coalition forming in the House and the Senate in favor of relaxing or lifting the embargo. Um, so you have farm state Republicans from Kansas and Minnesota and Arkansas and Louisiana who are going to travel to Cuba and say, why can't we export more food to Cuba? The answer is because U.S. law prohibits the ability of extending private credit to the Cubans. So the Cubans have to pay in advance for any food deliveries. And the Cubans say, well, I can get the same food from Argentina or Brazil or Mexico on credit. And so I'm going to go buy it there. So food uh, exports from U.S. to Cuba keep declining because we're, not, we're at a competitive disadvantage that we have created for ourselves. And uh, the farm states don't like that very much. So how am I doing on time? I, I will uh, try to give you a little bit of the other side of, of the coin, right? So let's go back to some basic facts. The Castros and their cronies are still in power. And they're establishing a transition process where they will likely retain control of the state and key strategic sectors of the economy for the long term. And this includes elements of the military, which have their own military controlled companies in different parts of the, uh, of the government. Um, so this means that every time a US traveler goes, or any traveler goes to Cuba, a portion of those proceeds are taxed and do go to this you know, illegitimate uh, repressive regime. And uh, this is one of the arguments that uh, you hear a lot. Other people say, look, the economic reform program that the Cubans are, are doing is a fraud. It's too slow. They're blocking the growth of the private sector. And basically, the Cuban government has lost a lot of opportunities over the last, say, four years when Obama was in the White House, moving in this direction toward normalization, and they were still too slow in picking up the ball. So I can give you some very concrete examples of that, but I think I'll, I'll move on to come uh, to cover some other areas. Um, so overall, I would say uh, the balance sheet is a little disappointing, and a lot of the promised reforms on the Cuban side have not materialized as yet. Um, now, Obama went to visit uh, in March of 2016. Historic visit, first time since Calvin Coolidge, uh, a big deal. And it gave him the chance to speak on public TV which is the only TV in Cuba, uh, and radio with a very clear message about you know, your, the aspirations of the Cuban people for freedom and, and prosperity need to be met. And that was really a, a very uplifting moment for a lot of Cubans. And, and Obama has very high popularity, way above the Castros in, in Cuba for articulating this. And of course, it was a great threat to the hardliners in Cuba. And you've seen a blowback since then where they felt that, whoa, you, you came too far in here. You're like the Trojan horse. And uh, you did see, you know, Raul Castro has said publicly that we have multi part, we have two parties in Cuba. We have the Fidelistas and we have the Raulistas. Um, and, you know, it's, 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 it's a joke, but in fact, I think that's exactly what's playing out that just as in this country, there is a political debate. There's a spectrum of views in Cuba. And we may not see those debates publicly, but when you get to know Cubans and you talk to them, including many people in higher positions of authority, you hear what's going on behind the scenes. And there is this, um, there's this very uh, tough uh, debate going on about to what extent we should even uh, work with the United States. After all, they're, they're the enemy. Um, they're also uh, unable to attract the foreign investment they need, in part because of financing, because the banks are not willing to, um, uh, even though the regulations allow them, they will not uh, loan uh, the Cuban, uh, anyone wanting to do business in Cuba, the money they, they need. Um, so the idea that was at the heart of this policy, that over time economic liberalization 
uh, will improve uh, life for most Cubans and create some kind of independence from the state would eventually lead to some kind of greater political freedoms. Uh, that's the theory of the case, but we have other counterexamples like China and Vietnam where they've opened themselves uh, economically, but we have not seen that kind of change uh, politically. So the question is, will, will that happen to Cuba uh, as well? Um, and I have to say that looking at the human rights situation in Cuba, uh, there's still a lot of uh, harassment, detention, repression of opposition groups. Um, and uh, some political prisoners have been rearrested, including recently. Um, they were supposed to allow the Red Cross to visit. They haven't allowed that. And I can go on and on as to why uh, this is not going uh, the way it should. So what happens next? And I'll, f I'll try to finish this up. Um, so a year from now, Raul Castro has said he will step down from power. So for the first time, we'll have a post-Castro government in Cuba. That means he will no longer be head of state or head of government, but he's likely to remain as head of the Communist Party. So kind of as the guardian of the the, the revolution, he would be able to supervise any the next generation of leadership. Um, so what we're likely to see is this kind of hybrid regime where you might have some progress on economic reforms, uh, but not much on political freedoms. And uh, you, you do have a new generation that is coming to power, but very gradually and without much signals of where they're going to take the country. So it's a big question mark about what's going to happen a year from now in Cuba in terms of the substance. And uh, so a lot of the, the pro-embargo groups in the United States say this is the time that we should actually tighten the embargo. They say, see, things are not changing in Cuba. We should reverse the normalization policies uh, reduce our embassy there, tighten the embargo, and in this weak moment for Cuba, force a hard regime change collapse in Havana. So where do we go from here? Um, in my view, we kind of go back to the basics. What is in our national interests? Uh, our national interest, given the whole panoply of, of factors here, I think is to continue to support the Cuban people's efforts uh, for change in Cuba, but without provoking a total collapse, which in my view could lead to a major migration crisis or even civil war. What we want is a soft landing, a soft transition that will take some time. So using our soft power, and remember the embargo is still in place, so we still have that tool to use, um, and doing much more on the kind of people-to-people -people diplomacy and generating pressure for more economic liberalization, uh, help Cuba to bring it up to 21st century standards, both on uh, not just economic and social rights, but political and civil rights as well. That's the idea, but it will take a lot of time and it requires strategic patience and it requires allies uh, to join us in this effort. So it's not just the United, S the United States. Um, we need to work overtly, not covertly, uh, within this environment. And if the time is right, we should, if the conditions are right, uh, go ahead and, and lift or at least modify the embargo so it doesn't punish all of Cuban uh, society. And, and that way I think we will position the United States as an agent of positive change rather than punishing the Cuban people for the sins of its leaders. I'll stop there. Please, questions. I see a hand there. Uh, at the onset of your talk, you mentioned that it's against the law for U.S. citizens to visit Cuba as a tourist. As a tourist. I understand that Carnival Cruise has just announced that they're starting to make Havana one of their stops. How's that going to work? So the cruise companies are very keen on getting in on the cruise business around Cuba. And not just Carnival, but uh, Holland America, I think, and, and um, 
Norwegian Cruise Lines, which happens to be run by a Cuban American, and he's very keen to, to get back. But uh, the deal is that they have to do it under the regulations of the Treasury and the Commerce Department, which require people-to-people -people activities or some other kind of license exception to the embargo, which includes um, educational and history, uh, arts and culture type of, of visit. So as long as they incorporate uh, the, the majority of their activities in that category, they can do this. Uh, the Obama administration has generally moved toward um, what are called general licenses. So basically, if you meet this on paper, you can do it unless you're told otherwise. And so they're, they're, gonna, they're moving into this direction. Now, Cuba doesn't have much of the infrastructure to accommodate all these ships, but the cruise lines say, ah, that doesn't matter, we can pilot the, the passengers on board and take them around to meet with uh, Cubans in different cultural and educational activities, and that's how it meets the, meets the test. Now, you can imagine the hardliners are saying, you know, that's, that's a total abuse of this uh, provision, and they really are tourists. Um, the counter argument is, yeah, but a lot of this money is being spent on uh, the private sector in Cuba. It's helping the Cuban people, uh, making them more independent from the state. And I've seen that firsthand. If you go to Cuba, please stay at a B&B. &B. Get to know our Cuban neighbors. They, for the most part, love Americans, and they're very warm and friendly. And it's a, you know, you'd think after all these years of hostilities that there would be this undercurrent, and there's not at all. And, and so I think that's what we need to, we need to, and not just Americans, you know, it's very important, all Americans should go. And they should go not only to have, get to know Cubans, but to see the failures of socialism. I mean, you know, it doesn't take much to, to see that. It's a great, it's a great lesson. Uh, but I think it also allows Cuban Americans which drive this policy, by the way. Did I say that clearly enough? I mean, who is driving Cuba policy, Cuban Americans, hardliners, in Congress, Senators Cruz, Rubio, Menendez, Democrats and Republicans, also as well in the House. And Cuba just hasn't been important enough for others to kind of say, wait a second, there's an alternative argument here. And you're seeing that happen now. So there's a much more of a, a diverse coalition in the Congress with a different point of view. And that's exactly what's in play right now with the, the Trump administration. Yes. I understand that there are negatives, certainly. But uh, from people I know that have gone there on various missions or whatever, uh, artistic missions, for instance, they all said they were shocked at the social attitude towards education and health care and how wonderful it was. Everybody has an education. Everybody has good health care. So this has been like, at the heart of the Cuban model, that they are able to deliver these economic and social rights to, to their people. And they do have something to be proud of. I mean, there have been dramatic improvements in the quality of life for the vast majority of Cubans. So let's give them that. At, in my view, a great cost. You know, I think there's been a total lack of, virtually total lack of political and civil rights in the country. There's no free media. Uh, for people who want a different opinion, it's very hard to get news. There's very little uh, access to the internet. It's beginning to grow, uh, but they have a long ways to go. So, you know, if we stepped back, and it, it's not about the U.S. as the enemy, but it's about Cubans solving their own problems, I think you'd get to a much more moderate uh, uh, regime. Uh, but that we haven't given them the space to, to do that. I would also add that because of the economic difficulties, uh, the quality of health care and education, from what I'm hearing, is going down. And partly that's also because they have to export more and more doctors and teachers to other countries to get revenue to sustain the economy. So there's, there is definitely some tension going on. And as more and more people retire and receive, like, I said $30 a month, it's about eight or $10 for retirees. You can't survive. And so the, the flow of remittances from Cuban diaspora is critical lifeline for, for most Cubans. Not most, I mean, it, it actually falls along different social and um, racial lines, but it is very important. Yeah. Yes, uh, well, you, you did uh, allude uh, briefly to uh, our new president but what about uh, Tsar Vlad? I mean, Putin. Uh, and where has the Russian 
cube, and I guess I hear a few things, but it's kind mm -hmm. of overt. Yeah, no, I didn't really get into that, but there's certainly a story to tell. The, um, th there's a very good relationship between Cuba and Russia, nothing like what it was before, and when the, the, the Russians pulled out, uh, ever since, they've um, been very cautious about, you know, we're not going to start writing you a blank check, but in recently they have begun stepping up their assistance. They forgave uh, like over three billion dollars of debt that the Cubans owed the Russians, and in exchange they were given favorable uh, conditions for investing in, in Cuba. Now I haven't seen much materialize on that front, but that is something to watch. There's also fear that the Russians could reopen what's called the Lourdes uh, Signal Intelligence Operation, which is a listening station that the Russian Soviets used against us, um, which has been mothballed, but that could uh, really, you know, not, not something we would welcome. Uh, so there's that factor as well. And I think Putin also enjoys just kind of um, symbolically at least, uh, you know, hitting the, the wasp nest. Now there's another actor that's very important that I haven't mentioned, which is China. Uh, China, of course, as you know, has become a very important economic actor throughout Latin America, and that includes Cuba. Cuba, largely for ideological reasons, uh, uh, has become uh, an interesting target for them. Uh, and we'll see how far it develops. I think the more we put pressure on China in the South China Sea, in their neighborhood, the more you might see Chinese activism in our neighborhood. And don't be surprised that there's a little bit of tit for that tat in that area as well. Other questions? Yeah. I wonder if you're not overstating the impact of the sanctions. Uh, number one, we have had relations with Cuba throughout this period of 50 years, which is supposedly a period of a failed policy. Uh, you can take the drug issue and the fact that the Castros very effectively have kept drugs from becoming anything or a transit point into the United States, cooperation in fisheries, cooperation in weather, storms, aviation, so, uh, and the back channel uh, uh, conversations that we have had uh, going back to General Goodell, whatever his name was, who was trotting around there even in Goodell's heyday. But we have had communication with them. As to the uh, uh, sanctions, um, it's an excuse for the Castro boys, if you will, because you can literally get almost anything you want in Cuba if you can pay for it. You mentioned the problem in financing. Well, <clears throat> yes, the U.S. financial institutions are limited, obviously, by pullback and series of rules but there was nothing to stop their getting the financing from other countries, but they weren't willing to do it because Cuba is not a good credit risk. Mm. Um, you mentioned capital. The Canadians and the English have already been in with the hotels and the development of the tourist industry. Mm. So uh, I know when we were there, somebody had a birthday and darned if they didn't whip out a nice old bottle of Hershey's chocolate and spread it around on the cake and somebody wanted some salsa picante hot sauce for something and they bring in Tabasco from Louisiana. <laughs> you can get these things. Mm -hmm. And as to the $30 a month, uh, that I still find interesting because in our tour we had the opportunity in people to people to meet a retired baseball player Fidel, of course, likes baseball, so he retired on 700 coups. Yeah, the, right. yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, if you look back on your comments, are you overstating the impact mm -hmm. of the sanctions? So I think you pointed to some interesting aspects of the relationship, which did continue throughout the years of hostilities and the embargo, at, but you have to acknowledge at a very minimal level. So we did not have an embassy. We had what was called an interest section, which had a limited number of staff on, on site. And also, uh, 
had no real relationship with government officials. So if uh, there was some important government meeting with foreign diplomats, the U.S. was not included, they had no ability to have any kind of knowledge or information or influence uh, in terms of our normal bilateral relations that you'd see anywhere else. And the same thing, of course, was true with the Cuban mission in Washington, which was under the Swiss flag because we didn't recognize Cuba as a full um, partner. So y y there was always, yes, the bare essentials were done. And of course, it ebbed and flowed depending on who was in the White House. So during some period in the Clinton administration, you began a set of talks across the fence line, which was uh, the fence line between Guantanamo Naval Base and outside the base. And you would have uh, a dialogue going on between our security officials. And then the Coast Guard became more involved, in particular on not only uh, counter-narcotics and migrant smuggling. And we had a certain number of protocols around that. But overall, it was, I would say, a very restricted one, including to the point where uh, one of our ambassadors uh, uh, took the initiative, which was blessed by the Bush administration, of creating a ticker tape around the U.S. Embassy, flashing news stories about what was really happening in the world, um, which completely enraged uh, Fidel Castro. And he then um, put up about 50 flagpoles with Cuban flags in front of this billboard so that people couldn't see it. Um, so, you know, there's those um, fights that were going on uh, throughout the way. But yes, Back Channel Diplomacy, there's a great book on the subject, if you're interested, by Peter Kornblue and Bill Leogrand. goes through all the different uh, efforts to try to create some kind of uh, negotiation, and most of them, most of them failed until until President Obama. On terms of their access to financing and, and goods, um, I think what we've seen in the last period is even under the Obama administration, the Treasury Department, OFAC, the Foreign Assets Control Office, imposed very high penalties on a number of not only U.S. but international banks, particularly in Europe and I'm talking billions of dollars for violating the sanctions policy. And that has really caused a major chilling effect in their willingness to engage. And yes, it is because uh, they might not have good business deals or good credit worthy risk, but it's, it's, more, it's more than just that. And now with the embargo loosening, there are more and more companies that do want to do deals with Cuba and uh, the banks are saying no. The other development is interesting is that there's a Paris club of, of creditors and they have gotten together and renegotiated their debt with Cuba. And as a result, the Cubans are being held to a much stricter repayment schedule than and they are trying very hard to adhere to. And as a result, they've entered this period of, of austerity in Cuba because they want to make these payments to increase their credit worthiness because they know it's a vulnerable point. And so far they are, but at some significant cost to the social safety net. Yeah. Uh, so from the Cubans' perspective, instead of being beholden to the U.S. or Russia or China or Venezuela, why not just open the books and get IMF World Bank funding? Partly because there's this, you know, great ideological resistance to the whole idea of caving in to the Washington consensus and neoliberal institutions. That really goes against the grain for them. And I think they would only do it as a last resort. They have begun talks with something called the Andean Development Bank, CAF in Spanish. And they have reached some kind of technical assistance agreements. But that's a development bank with not nearly as many resources as these other institutions. So it's been, um, it's been a just very slow, slow going. I think they're counting on this infusion of new foreign direct investment uh, and continued support from, uh, even though it's minimal or has been reduced from Venezuela, that China and Russia would help them out, other countries like Angola. Uh, with the oil supplies, sending more doctors abroad, this kind of combination, plus all the remittances. I mean, it's almost $3 billion a year that is coming in from the Cuban diaspora. Um, so that's real money for them. And now the tourists coming in as well, or I mean, travelers, not tourists, travelers. <laughs> um, so we've heard something from the new president about uh, 
to a look at the deal and see if it's yeah. a good deal. Do, do we know what, anything more about what that actually means uh, yeah. other than just what he said? Or? So maybe I'll end on this point. I see Bill coming down. So um, I've written a, a, an essay with my colleague about what a deal could look like. And it involves a combination of things that we've been really wanting to get, which is a resolution of the property claims, a return of fugitives who have fled to Cuba and we want back in the United States, uh, more cooperation on, on the Cubans who are here illegally, criminals who we want to send back to Cuba. There are a number of kind of very practical things that uh, we could try to reach a deal on. Uh, and you have different factions. I think there is a business-oriented faction within the Trump uh, administration that does want to figure out a way through this. And many of them, uh, including uh, Trump business people themselves, have gone to Cuba looking for deals, by the way. And so they're now running Cuba policy. Jason Greenblatt is the appointed negotiator on Cuba. And he's the one who went to Cuba. So there's some of that uh, side of it. Now, on the other hand, you have Vice President Pence and Senator Rubio and others who are saying, no, 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 roll it back, roll it back. And so we have this uh, battle underway on what's going to happen next. So the policy is officially under review. And I expect in the next either month to three months, uh, there'll be an announcement where my guess is that they'll come up with some kind of symbolic rollback at some kind of things that certain things they don't like, but not everything. They won't do 100% rollback, and they'll start a negotiation process on the other items on the agenda. Thank you, sir, for a, a great overview. Thank you all for joining us. Ted will be around if you have an un unasked question that we didn't have a chance to get to. Let me thank you again for coming. If you can join us next week, uh, it will actually be our last lecture of the semester. We're getting to that point. Uh, I see students nodding and faculty grinning. Okay. Uh, we'll have our colleague Vonda Felbab brown out, uh, who's been with us before. I hope you've had a chance to hear her. She'll be talking about uh, her new book, Mexico, Cartels, Cops, and Corruption. So we'll stick with the foreign policy theme, but talk about a, a neighbor and so many more complicated and transitioning issues. Thanks again. Hope we see you next week. Thank you. Just terrific. Thank you.